going to get started in just a few minutes with Johnny Kingslake of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Uh, first off, as I said, thank you so much for joining us today for another session of EI Live for K-12 students and educators uh, brought to you by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. For those of you who are joining us for the first time or who may not be familiar with the Earth Institute, we are a research organization within Columbia. Uh, we blend research in the physical and social sciences, education, and practical solutions to guide the process of sustainable development. Experts that make up the Earth Institute include earth scientists, economists, business and policy experts, specialists in public health and law, researchers, teachers, and students. The Institute is made up of more than two dozen research centers and several hundred people who collaborate across many disciplines and schools within Columbia. What we're hoping to do with these EI Live K-12 sessions is to introduce you to our interdisciplinary work through our experts. Over the next few months, we'll feature a variety of these sessions for K-12 students and teachers, and we'll also be building on the EI Live series to include other content. The title of today's session is The Tip of the Ice Sheet, What's Happening in Antarctica. And we're lucky to have Johnny from Lamont joining us. He'll be discussing a very relevant topic with us, topic with us today, which will lead us to better understand the West Antarctic ice sheet, how it's changing, and how his work is critical to the, to the understanding of the impacts of changing ice on sea level rise. We'll have Johnny do his presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions towards the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat box just to the right of this video, or email me directly if you would prefer to do that. Once the session is done, we'll share a link with everyone who has registered for the event so that you can access the recording later on. We appreciate your patience with us as we move to develop uh, additional online content for everyone and figure out our best practices. If you are having technical difficulties, please email me directly. You can also try to close and restart your browser or try a different browser if YouTube isn't working well. So without further ado, uh, here's Johnny Kingslake. Johnny, you can take it away. Thanks, Cassie. And thanks so much for organizing this. And um, Hope everyone can hear me clearly. I'm not sure if you can see me, but uh, I'm here in my apartment in New York City and uh, sheltering in place just like all of you. So this is a really great opportunity to get uh, some of my science out there to the world uh, in, in this online setting. So thanks, Cassie, for setting all this up. Right, so yeah, oh, I'm gonna talk about the Antarctic ice sheet. So I'm gonna talk about what ice sheets are as well. And I'm gonna talk about past and present changes. But what's really interesting is the ice sheet is changing today, presently, but the way that, and one of the ways in which we can improve how we understand that is actually to look at the past. So that's the past changes part of the title there. And so that's actually what my work when I went to Antarctica was all about. So yeah, I'm an assistant professor at Columbia University and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and I'm actually a glaciologist. So somebody who studies glaciers and ice sheets. And here in this picture here is, um, here is Antarctica on the left. That's what it looks like from space. And then on the right is actually uh, a crazy picture of showing the speed at which the ice is flowing. So that might be a mind blowing thing to a lot of people. The ice actually flows like a fluid. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. And if there's only one thing which you come away from this talk with today, it ideally would be the idea that ice actually flows like a viscous fluid, like a syrup or a honey. And that's the, one of the most exciting things about it. And that's why a lot of us study this. But before we get onto that, I wanted to give you a quick, back, uh, a quick introduction to my background. And so if anyone's interested in this field as a career, then you can maybe think about how I got here. So I did an undergraduate degree um, which in the UK, and I'm from the UK, and we, starting at 18, um, you, you can do undergraduate degrees in university. And I did mine in physics uh, at the University of York in the north of England here. And then I went on and did the next stage, if you're trying to have an academic career, the next stage is a PhD. And that's where you really get into doing research, scientific research. And I did that in, uh, still in the north of England here in Sheffield. 
And then the next stage after that, I got a job as a what we what was called a, a glacier geophysicist. So that's just somebody who studies glaciers and uses this thing called geophysics. And that's just a fancy word for some of the stuff I'll talk about today. Um, and I'll explain that later. And that was at some at the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. So all that was that before I was before I moved to Le Mont Doherty. So four years ago, I moved across the Atlantic to New York City, and now I work at Columbia University in Le Mont Doherty. So here we are. So here's looking at the Northern Hemisphere, where the vast majority of people live, and I think there's mostly US and UK people listening in today, so the places in which you all live. But my research is mostly focused on the other end of the planet, the Southern Hemisphere. And down here, you can see uh, this is South America, pointing down south and here's the Andes running along here and then it points directly south from there is the South Pole and covering the South Pole is the Antarctic ice sheet. Now this is um, one of the two big ice sheets on the planet and, and in these locations it snows in the winter just like it does in many other parts of the world but in the summer it never gets warm enough for that snow to completely melt away. So what happens? Well, the snow just builds up and up and up. Literally, if it doesn't melt away, what would happen on the streets of New York or where, wherever you are, the snow would just build up and up and up until it reaches hundreds or thousands of meters thick, thousands of, thousands of feet thick. And when it gets that big, it becomes what's called an ice sheet. So it stops, from, it, it stops just being a simple patch of snow or a patch of ice and it becomes uh, one of these continent sized objects called an ice sheet. One of the reasons we study them, not just because they're interesting, but because they store huge amounts of water. So you might have heard of the water cycle. So water is constantly being evaporated from the ocean and, and deposited as rainfall on the land. And then that water flows back into the ocean and that cycle continues. Well, a, set, a similar thing happens for ice sheets, except it doesn't just fall as rain, it falls as snow. So water is constantly being that snow is constantly being put into the ice sheets. And so at any one moment, there are uh, millions and millions of tons, billions of tons of water contained in the ice sheets. And why do we care about that? Well, because if the amount of water contained in the ice sheets changes a little bit, that water can go into the ocean and cause sea level to rise around the globe. And because so many of us live in cities or communities right next to the coast, a little bit of sea level rise can actually have really bad effects on people's livelihoods and people's homes and businesses. Right, so I've got two graphs in this presentation. This is the first one. This is a graph showing that sea level is today rising. And it's really just showing along the bottom here is time. So going from nine, the nine, early 1990s through to nearly to the present day, and this is a, a simple graph, but it, what's gone into it is a huge amount of complicated observations from space, looking at how high the sea level is on average across the globe. And what you see is this rising trend. And, what you, and it goes up in, you know, it goes from zero up to 80 millimeters. So that's only eight centimeters. But the concern is that this will continue to happen at an increasing rate. And one of the reasons that we people, people think that might be happening is because of the ice sheets. So let's go talk about them. Where's all this water coming from? Well, there's the second graph, second graph of the, uh, the presentation. Some of that water is coming from Antarctica. This is another one of these graphs with time along the, the horizontal here. And this time along the vertical, we have ice mass change. So it's how much mass you know, or volume, can think of it as volume, uh, that has the ice sheet lost over this time from 1990 to uh, 2017. And let's just concentrate on this purple line, this, this purple uh, band with a black line down the middle of it. Well, up until about 2000, it wasn't really doing very much. There was only a little bit of change. And then gradually since then, it's been accelerating. You see how it's curving down steeper and steeper. So really what that's saying is that Antarctica is losing a lot of ice and it's doing it faster over time. So 
clearly there's this increasing speed in which the ice is being lost from Antarctica and we're concerned that that continue, continue, could continue into the future. But what we really want to do is better predict how that's going to happen. We want to do that so that people can make plans on how to defend against sea level rise in their coastal communities. Uh, but the tricky thing is that I, predicting how ice sheets will change in the future is really, really difficult. To simplify things, it's really difficult because they're really, really big, which means they're really hard to observe, hard to measure. It's not like something, it's, you can't do an experiment in the lab, which it, 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 you know, on a desktop, like you can do in some fields to try and understand how ice sheets work. So just to show how big they are, this is a picture of Antarctica with the, the United States or the, uh, the contiguous United States overlaid on top of it. So crossing Antarctica is like crossing the whole of the mainland US. All right, so they're really big, but they're also really complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's lots of processes interacting and, um, and also the ice sheets aren't just sitting on their own. They, uh, they're, sit they're, not, they're not just sitting on their own isolated. They are in contact with the atmosphere above and the oceans at the sides and the ground beneath. And this graph, this kind of cartoon is trying to show some of that complexity. All these little arrows are showing a process which is acting on the ice or, the, or something that the ice is doing. So for example, there's energy, there's heat coming up from beneath, there's heat coming in from the ocean, there's snow falling in from the atmosphere, there's, um, there's ice flowing around and moving and, and, and fracturing, and all of those things interact in a complicated way to, to, to dictate how much and how quickly the ice loses, uh, the ice sheet loses mass and how quickly sea level goes up. All right, so that's, although it's difficult, predicting how ice sheets will change is one of the main aims of a glaciologist, some, somebody like me who wants to understand the ice sheets. Okay, let's talk about this, my favorite ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet. Well, we've already seen this picture before, but I didn't tell you how thick it reach, reaches. So right in the center here, it's thicker than it is at the sides. It's like a big dome like this. And in the center, it reaches 2.5 miles thick, which is genuinely an unimaginable um, height of ice. So what I've done is to uh, try and help you imagine this slightly. So this is the Empire State Building, which is, um, you know, eight miles south from where I'm standing now. And just the left of it, I've made this block. And if you, the block has a, an area the size of a city block. If you look down on top of it, it, had a, it covers a city block, but it, it is 2.5 miles high. So I'm going to zoom out to try and give you a picture, give you a feel for how much, how high that really is. So zoom out gradually, gradually. And you're going to see Manhattan and Central Park emerging in this picture. And gradually, there we go. That's the full 2.5 miles of ice. So in the center of Antarctica, that's, that's just pure ice and it's as wide as the United States. So an unimaginably large amount of ice. And as I said before, once you get that much of that much ice in one place, it actually starts to flow. Now this is a really new concept for lots of people and a strange concept. So imagine if you took an ice cube out of the freezer, if you dropped it on the floor or you smashed it with a hammer, it would break into small bits. It wouldn't be like a honey, it wouldn't squish. It would just smash into, into bits, right? It's a hard, material and scientists call that brittle. But when you get enough of it in one place, believe it or not, it does start to act like a syrup. That, although that ice actually gradually changes shape and stretches and squishes and stretches out towards the sides of the continent. Now, let me start that pitch, start, let me start that video again. So this is Antarctica again, and, over, and what's gonna appear is a bunch of colors and a bunch of lines. The colors tell you how fast the ice is moving. And the oranges, oranges in the middle, that means it's going about one meter per year, so very slow. And then the purples and the blues, that's moving more like a thousand meters a year. So it starts out slow in the middle and it starts stretching and going faster and faster and faster towards the edges until it breaks off and uh, becomes an iceberg. And 
So those are the colors, but the lines, they actually show the direction in which the ice is flowing. So in loads of places you see uh, lines converging together, almost like, a, like lots of little streams, like feeding bigger and bigger rivers. And you eventually get these big rivers of ice that we call ice streams, and they flow out towards the edges. So a lot of our work is trying to explain this pattern, you know, this complex pattern of ice flow. And as I said before, try to predict how it's going to change because all that flow really controls how quickly the ice is lost into the ocean and how quickly sea level goes up all around the globe. All right. So this is going to get a little bit more complicated, right? So as I said before, we want to know one way in which we can improve how we understand the ice now is by looking into the past and seeing how it flowed in the past. So that's actually what I was doing in Antarctica. So I visited this area to understand how the ice flowed in the past. Now, here's one big concept. Not only have you just learned the ice, that the ice sheet flows like a syrup, you also now I'm going to tell you that it used to flow differently in the past. Well, the whole the climate of the whole planet was very different in the past. It was a lot colder. Uh, there was less melting from the oceans. There was actually less snowfall. But overall, the ice sheet was actually much larger and it flowed in a completely different way. So here's the here's our aim. We're trying to understand how that how the ice sheet flowed in the plot in the past so that we can use this to help predict the future. And we used um, the way we do that is with computer models. OK, so there's the motivation. We want to know how the ice flowed in the past. Here's one idea about how it flowed in the past. Let's have a look. So here's 20,000 years ago. Here's the edge of the ice sheet here. This light blue is the ice sheet. And the colors behind, they show how low the, uh, the rock is beneath it. But you don't need to worry too much about that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what it was like at 20,000 years ago. And that's at 15,000 years ago. Look how the ice has, has shrunk a little bit. 10,000 years ago and 5,000 years ago. So that was the idea. Before we went to Antarctica, the idea was the ice sheet was bigger 20,000 years ago, and it gradually got smaller and smaller and smaller until today. So we wanted to go, you know, try and add a little bit more detail to that picture. So onto my fieldwork, onto some pictures. Here is me sat on a uh, on a snow machine. So these are things like motorbikes, but with a big track on the back and you drive it along and um, and it and it puts and, and you get dragged around on the, uh, on the surface of the, of the ice. And what we drag with us are these sledges and these sledges have lots of uh, food and equipment and tents and uh, fuel for this for the snow machines and also a bunch of science equipment, loads of me things to measure what's going on with the ice. And one of the things I've got, I've got labeled here is our ice radar. That's actually trailing out the back of this whole train of snow machines and sledges. And what that was there to do, it, that's a little bit like the radar you see on an airport. It's you know, on the air, in, at a control tower of an airport, the radar is spinning around and sending out radio waves and they're bouncing off planes and it's coming back to the people in the control tower and they can tell how far away the planes are and where they are. So we were doing exactly the same thing, except our radio waves go down into the ice and we listen back for echoes to see how thick the ice is. So that's what we were doing. When we were driving around, we were pinging out radio waves thousands of times a second and listening back for the echoes. So before I show you some, uh, some of our results, uh, Here's a short video of, of, of showing some of our activities, what it actually looked like to be there. Now, so that we, we get dropped off in little planes like these ones, and they land on the ice with skis, you can see there. And what you'll notice from this video is that this, the ground is very, very flat. See, on the way in, we saw some mountains poking through the ice. But once we got to where we were doing our measurements, the ground was was almost perfectly flat and all you see is um, sky and clouds and the snow beneath your feet so many of these videos are really just pictures of clouds because there's nothing else to take 
there's no landscapes to take photos of. But what they do show also is uh, our our uh, field camps and the, 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 the small tent that we were um, staying in. So uh, me and another another person were driving around on the surface of the ice for two months and we slept in this small tent and we didn't see any other people for, for that two month period. This is our little tent here, you can see. Now I won't show you the whole video because you can watch it on YouTube separately, but here's a picture of us doing some measurements. Here's a different, we actually had two types of rain. This is our other type of rain. This one it involved us sitting around uh, reading, reading our Kindles on the surface of the ice for hours on end. So it's a um, I'll just show you this picture of this, of this this particularly nice set of clouds and then I'll move on to show you some of our data. Okay, so, so here we are. Here's, this is our um, map of where we actually managed to travel. Now you notice all my pictures had this, the, the surface of the ice just looking completely plain white. But this is a satellite image of the surface of Antarctica and it looks all gray and there's some black patches and lighter areas. Well, this is actually a kind of a false color satellite image. And if you crank up the contrast on the image, this is what you get, which is remarkable really, given that when you're, in, when you're down there on the surface, it's completely flat and you can't see any of these features. Right, so these red and red and green lines are the, lo the locations where we got some of our radar data. Now, what does that look like? So this next slide is a little example of what the radar data looks like. And it's a bit like an MRI scan of, of, a, of a person's body or a person's brain. You know, when you get those multiple uh, images, multiple slices through somewhere and you can see all the structure within. And this is just one of those slices. So it's looking at the ice as if we were looking at it from the side. And this is the top of the ice sheet and 700 meters down. So not the two and a half miles, which I showed you with uh, the Empire State Building, but still pretty deep. 700 meters down, you see the base of the ice here with this, this bright reflector here. Now to take that um, MRI scan uh, analogy further, I can go to the next slide. And now we're looking in 3D it was if we're in the ice and this is the rock beneath the ice and this is the top of the ice above and we're going to take we're going to look at multiple slices through the ice over time uh, through these slides and what you see is that there's a whole bunch of stuff inside the ice and i could talk for hours about what all these things mean and we spent years thinking about what these particular features actually meant and we've written some scientific papers about this and essentially what we, what we decided they were, were actually cracks in the ice, which formed when the ice was flowing in a different way than it is today. And in fact, it showed that this place, which today has ice resting on the ground in the past was actually floating. The ice was actually floating and the ice sheet was smaller than it is today. And I will skip to the, um, the main point of that, of our papers on this subject have been that in fact, you know how I said the ice sheet, previously we thought the ice sheet shrank gradually from a larger size back to its size today. In fact, it did something else, it actually shrank to a smaller size than it is today and then grew at, gradually out over a few thousand years. So Antarctica was actually smaller than it is today a few thousand years ago. This is just, and the reasons for that are really complicated and it's just one added complication to this whole system. And then none of this removes the fact that Antarctica is shrinking today and it could continue in the future. But maybe the processes which we uncovered with our data could, in a few thousand years time from now, could actually slow down the retreat. But that's another more complicated discussion which I can get into if anyone wants to ask questions about that. So to, to sum up, again, coming back to this, predicting how the ice sheets will change in the future is really difficult because of all these processes. And um, we've, with our work in Antarctica, we spent four months in a tent, just me and another guy over two field seasons. 
And what we've added to is really just, we've just highlighted some more complexity. We've showed that it's more complicated and we're gonna to have to try harder to try and predict the future of the ice sheet. But gradually we build, the whole idea was we, we work out what complexity there is and then try to understand those complicated factors in more detail. And that's a slow process, but there's thousands of people working on this and it's a fascinating field. So if anyone has any questions, please fire away and I'll try and answer them. Any questions about the field work and what it was like to be in Antarctica? And um, yeah, fire away. Great, thanks Johnny. So I, uh, I've been collecting a list of questions. Um, the most, I'll start with the most one and then work my way back uh, to the beginning. There was a question about the X axis on a graph that you showed. Um, and I wanna see if we can find, Absolutely. I think it was before, just before this. This is great because I went through things quite quickly and now we can go back to any details anyone wants to talk about. Yeah. Was it this one or the next one? Um, if you could go through both, then we can cover. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So this is just okay. the, this is sea level around the globe and how it's changed over time. So based on some, um, datum around the 90s how much has sea level gone up and it's gone up eight you know six to eight centimeters um and that's all done from satellites and they've they've measured you know averaged across the whole of the of the, of the ocean and in fact they've tried to take out the effects of uh pinatubo and enso so what are these things these are pinatubo is a, a volcanic eruption which um, because these, this, these scientists were most interested in the climate or the, the anthropogenic impact on sea level rise. So they, did, they were trying to remove the effect of this volcanic eruption on sea level rise so that they could see the long-term trends. And also this ENSO is a, a natural variability in the climate, which they also tried to remove. Okay, so and then here we're focusing on the contribution of Antarctica. And um, again, the x-axis is time going from 1990 to 2017. And on the left vertical axis is the mass change in gigatons. So a gigaton is a cubic kilometer of ice. And so it's kilometer by kilometer by kilometer, huge cube of ice. And Antarctica has lost roughly 3000 of those in the time that we've had comprehensive measurements, which is only since 1990. And when you average out that mass across the whole of the, the ocean, the, all the world's oceans, the other vertical axis shows you how much sea level that, con that, that corresponds to. So it's actually a small number, right? It's only it's less than 10 millimeters. But the, the, the concern is that could accelerate and many simulations suggest it could go up to uh, 50 centimeters or a meter this century, just from Antarctica. So that ends up being, a, and that has a potential large impact on communities around the world. Okay, great, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go make my way back to uh, some questions that came up towards the beginning of the presentation. Um, so the first one was, how impactful is the melting of glaciers versus the melting of ice sheets? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a really good question because currently glaciers are a larger contribution to sea level rise around the world than ice sheets. And, um, but ice sheets contain much, a much larger potential for future chain, for, for future sea level rise. Uh, now I can't remember the numbers. So, Greenland contains roughly six meters of sea level rise potential. Antarctica contains 60, six zero meters of sea level rise potential. And all the glaciers around the world, there's 220,000 of them, but they're so small that overall they make a much smaller potential impact on sea level rise. But they're changing much faster than the ice sheets today. So complicated answer, but currently it's the, Greek, currently it's the glaciers because they're changing the fastest. 
but Greenland and, and Antarctica have a much larger potential impact. And that's why a lot of our research is focused on them. Great, thank you. We're getting a lot of questions, so this is great. Okay, um, there's, <laughs> there's two. There's two questions related to research stations. So first, were you close to Palmer Station? And secondly, um, are the Antarctic uh, research stations flowing as well and moving <laughs> in motion? <laughs> yeah, they are, they are, of course, absolutely. The ones which are on the ice, do they are moving, absolutely. They're not, they aren't all on the ice. So. First of all, Palmer Station is up here in the Antarctic Peninsula. I actually went with the British Antarctic Survey. Like I, um, like my first slide was about, which mentioned the British Antarctic Survey. They have a station down here. Uh, can you all see the cursor? Yeah, I think hopefully you can. Um, down here uh, called Rother, which is actually not on the ice. That's on rock, so that's not flowing. But I was actually further south in this location. So um, I was quite far from any research stations. Now there's been, um, talking about ice, uh, talking about research stations on the ice, there's the British re research station called Halley, which has had a lot of press recently because it's on an ice shelf and it, it does move quite quickly. And in fact, there were some cracks opening up in the ice shelf, which made it not a safe place to be anymore. So they actually had to move the station onto areas uh, which, which were upstream of the cracks. Because if the cracks chopped off the ice shelf while the research station was on it, it would become, you know, it would be on an iceberg and that would really be not safe. Okay, great. Um, there was a question about whether or not the green block next to the Empire State Building was the thickness of the ice. And though I just wanted you to, to confirm yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it is. Absolutely. It's 2.5 miles thick. And okay. um, I've got another visualization which shows a gigaton and the gigaton would be a little cube and it would fill up the bottom section of Central Park and extend, or maybe half of the bottom section of Central Park and extend the same distance height. So that would be, that's how much the ice is losing. Uh, thousands of those is how much ice the ice is losing every, over that period. Um, next question. Um, is there any reason why East Antarctica seems to melt at a slower rate than West Antarctica on the graph? So I think this was referring to a specific oh, yeah. image in your, in your presentation. Yeah. I, I, I'll answer it using this map as well. So there is, um, there's at least two reasons why people are less concerned about East Antarctica than West Antarctica. So East Antarctica is this whole section uh, here and West Antarctica is this section and then there's also the Antarctic Peninsula was on that graph separately. Now, one reason that West Antarctica is, is changing faster is because currently the ocean next to this part of West Antarctica is, seems to be warmer than it was before. So it seems to be melting away at the ice and that seems to have triggered a kind of dramatic response in the ice sheet. Um, now, the other reason though is a little bit more subtle is that the the ground underneath the, the geology, the rock underneath the East Antarctic ice sheet is actually a lot higher. It sits above sea level. And so it may be very thick, it may be 2.5 miles thick, but the top is also very high. So the ground is still above the sea level. That's not true in West Antarctica. Most of West Antarctica, the ice is actually resting below sea level. And so that makes it more vulnerable to the ocean. So once, once this ice starts to retreat, then the ocean can still lap up against it and, and remove more ice. Whereas that's not true in most of East Antarctica. There are some sections where that is true, but not for most of it. But that's a great question. Great, we're getting a lot of great questions here. Um, I have sort of three related questions about ice flow. So I'm gonna group them together for you. Um, does the ice flow due to pressure from the ice on top? Um, why does the ice flow? Is it a natural process? Um, and how did you figure out that ice flowed the way it did 20,000 years ago? Yeah, so essentially it's, it, it, it does flow because of pressure above. That is a, basically it. It's the same as if you put um, poured honey onto a table and then you tip the table up, the honey wants to flow downhill. Really, it's just a gravity-driven thing. And um, 
even more than that, you wouldn't even need to tip the table up, right? You pour honey into one spot and it would actually start flowing outwards under its own weight. And it's really this, or maybe another analogy is like pancake batter in the middle of a saucepan, in, in the middle of a pan. It doesn't stay up in a, it doesn't pile up into a huge pile. It flows out. And what it literally, literally is, is the surface of the pancake batter or the surface of the ice wants to flatten itself out it starts to steepen up like this. And that actually generates forces which push the ice in, you know, towards the place where the ice surface is lower. But a short way of saying it is basically like the first question, yes, it's the pressure. <laughs> it's really the spatial gradient in the pressure. And then um, why does it flow? Well, not only does it have that, that force is there, right? So that pressure gradient I just talked about is there, but also the ice itself has to be malleable. It has to be, you know, uh, ready to flow. And that's what's going on there is the actual um, atoms are, are aligned in a crystal and they're actually sh changing shape. And they're like, all those, all those crystals are actually, all those atoms are actually realigning themselves and changing shape the whole time. So the ice can go from like this shape to this shape. So it squashes in the vertical direction, stretches in the horizontal, for example. So that's really how it happens. There's a force on one, on one side and there's a response of the ice on the other. Now, how do we work out what was going on in the past? Well, um, on this side of the ice sheet, we use these observations of these, these cracks and we related, well, I could actually show you. We, um, we looked at these features and there is, they have no business being there today, if you know what I mean. So the ice is flowing really slowly in this spot. There's basically no chance that those fractures, and there's no chance the ice would manage to fracture itself in this location. But what we do know is that ice can fracture itself when it's flowing faster, when it's being stretched faster. And we looked at a location just to the side of this area, which is flowing fast and made the, the leap, made the analogy that these kind of crevasses, these kind of fractures have been formed in that location. And so we um, backed out how long ago the ice had to be flowing fast in this location to explain these fractures, to explain how tipped over they are and how deep they've been buried. So they, it, it ends up being quite a complicated three-dimensional argument about the details, but essentially that's it. We drew analogies to present day situations and said, okay, well, this the best explanation for these features is that they were doing that in the past. And that was just one part piece of evidence which went together with, with several others which made up a, a scientific paper about this topic. Great, thanks. Um, so the following question is um, more about the interior of the Earth. So do we know how the interior of the Earth uh, may be either moving um, or also heating up? Um, perhaps the mantle of the Earth are heating and warming from below? Absolutely, yeah. That's part of the, that is part of the system, part of the comp complexity of the system. Here's this plot again, and these little arrows are poking up uh, here, we've got two sets of arrows coming up from the earth below. And one of them is this wiggly arrow and that's called the geothermal heat flux. So it is, it's the heat coming out from the earth. So the, the, the center of the earth is really warm and there's, you know, it's, it's warm because of radioactivity going on. And it's also warm left over from the formation of the solar system, in fact. So it's warm and that heat is gradually like being conducted up to the surface. So if you put your hand on the ground anywhere on the planet, there is a small amount of heat and being emitted. It's actually 60 milliwatts per square meter, right? Uh, on average. So that heat, it happens everywhere. Most of the time it just gets blown away in the wind and it becomes a small part of what controls the surface of like of the ground. But under an ice sheet, you've got this big insulating blanket of ice and that heat actually goes to warm up that ice. And in lots of locations, it can actually cause melting. So there's actually, the ice actually gets melted by that geothermal heat and you cause and that water which is generated has to go somewhere and it sometimes ponds in lakes and sometimes flows through little channels and it really has a big impact on how quickly the ice flows which is really cool then of course, there's actually the other set of arrows is uh, cool, is labeled here bedrock adjustment and not only does heat come up through the ground also the ground itself moves up and down and it moves up and down in response to changes in the ice itself, because the ice is heavy and it's loading the ground and it's, it's shifting up and down. So 
In fact, that is the that movement is actually what we hypothesized was the cause of the ice sheet shrinking and then readvancing, regrowing, because the ground took thousands of years to pop back up, and then that caused the ice to actually regrow. Again, too much details to get into, but that's it's all linked together and, and part of the part of this diagram with all these these arrows on trying to show you how complicated it all is. Okay, the next set of questions are more about your research, um, your research station and your team. Um, what are some of the logistics of moving a research station? And how far are you and your team or your uh, co um, PIs, principal investigators, um, how far are you from taking a sample of the ice in the center of Antarctica? Uh, yeah, that's, well, the logistics of removing a research station, I, so a research, a full on research station is a, is a huge set of logistics. And there's actually a BBC documentary about how they moved that one I was talking about, um, called Halley Research Station. So Halley, H-A-E-E-Y. So if anyone wants to, there's a whole documentary about it, if anyone's interested. Uh, on our scale, we were only moving one field camp, which would be just me and this other guy and a tent and um, all our science equipment. And even that was quite logistically tiring. So if you, we were there for eight weeks and we moved camp, I think 13 times. And a, a camp move day is a big, big day. So you wake up at seven and you try and get moving by nine because it takes, you know, much more than an hour to get everything packed down. And then you drive for, uh, you know, anything up to four, 14 hours to try and re relocate. And then you put the tents up at the other end and um, try and eat some food and then get into bed and get your sleeping bag and try to sleep. And somewhere along the, on along the lines, this guy I was with also managed to find the energy to take those time-lapse videos I showed you, which is amazing, which is incredible. And so now, because <laughs> of his efforts, I have these videos to show you all about what it's all like. Um, right, well, what about taking samples of the ice in the middle of Antarctica. Well, absolutely, absolutely. In, in this location, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a place where they actually have done an ice core. Just last year, they've drilled an ice core, th drilled a hole down through the ice and extracted samples all the way along. And you end up with this long cylinder of ice called an ice core. And I was, I was really pleased to have the opportunity to show them where the ice was thickest. Or, and, and show them exactly where to, to drill their ice core. And, it, you know, there were many, many ice cores around, but this particular one was just one which I um, visited the location first and could tell them where the best place to drill the core was. And they've just completed that. And in fact, we're going to get some data from that core back uh, next year. I hope, I think it will have to be next year after all this disruption, but they're going to give us some samples and we're going to do some measurements on that ice at Le Mans as part of a project about something else. So it's all, all linked together nicely. Great, thank you. Um, so there was a question about how many more questions we'd be able to answer. We're gonna go right until three o'clock and I have, a <laughs> list, I have a list of about eight to 10 questions right now. I'm going to try to group them together for Johnny. So keep <laughs> typing and uh, type away and we'll do our best to capture everything. Uh, and there was also a question about this video being available online. So what we do is we'll make sure that this gets, the link gets sent out to everybody. We don't post it publicly. So within two or three days, we will have a version of this video sent to everyone who has RSVP'd for this session. So uh, back to the questions for Johnny. Uh, two sort of related questions. Um, what would Antarctica look like without ice? Would it look similar? Is there land underneath? Um, yeah. And why is it why is it considered a, a continent if it's just ice? <laughs> yes, great question. Um, if I had more time, I could get you the picture of what it would look like without ice, because we know where the, the bottom of the ice is and we know where the rock is underneath it quite well. And what it would look like would be um, East Antarctica would be a big continent. There would be ground there. Um, this is all above sea level, so it would be a continent. It's actually a craton, if anyone does geology. It's a very old patch of the crust. And uh, West Antarctica would look like an archipelago, lots and lots of islands. 
uh, but still continental crust. So geologists separate the Earth's crust into two types of crust, continental crust and um, oceanic crust. So that's actually why people would call this a continent. But, apart, but, but besides that, the ground is actually above sea level. It's not just ice. Great, thank you. Um, could you give us a sense of how much snow accumulates in central Antarctica, adding to the snow ice influx? Yep, yep, absolutely. So in the middle, it's maybe only a few centimeters a year. It's actually the, one of the driest deserts on the planet. And as you go out towards the edges, you get closer to the moisture sources, which, which are the ocean, and you get more and more snowfall and you get more like me maybe two meters a year. But in the middle, very, very dry. Okay, great. Uh, there was a question about whether or not you can explain how much energy is generated by geothermal heat. Is it enough to power uh, light or boil water, for example? Um, well, in general, it, it, in general it is. You know, in, in some parts of the world where you have perhaps volcanic activity, you have really effective geothermal heat fluxes. And, uh, but for most of the world, uh, geothermal heat is really, it can be used as a heat source or, or it's basically a way of making heating your home more efficient because it acts as a, uh, a big source of um, background energy. So geothermal heat in Antarctica isn't anything special. It's the same all around. It's, you know, it may be a bit higher and might be a bit lower than elsewhere, but on average, it's the, the same things happening all around the planet. Great. Uh, there have been a few questions about this. Uh, have you found any life um, or living matters in the glacial lakes that are still under glaciers? Do you expect to find any, any plants uh, or animals? <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I mean, I haven't personally been involved with any of those explorations of lakes, but I do know a little bit about them. They, they, there is a lot of interest in those locations as potential habitats for really exotic strange organisms mi microorganisms rather than larger organisms now i don't want to get out of my depth too far here but last year there was a lake called lake mercer i think which was drilled into in this location where my cursor is and they found um tardigrades those hardy microorganisms which which can survive all sorts of things and they were very surprised by that now i don't know there was some question as to whether the scientists introduced them themselves while they were drilling. <laughs> so I think that was up in the air. And so we'll have to wait for the actual science to come out about that. But certainly it's a big field of research. Subglacial microbiology is a thing people really, really are excited about. Great, thank you. Uh, a question about who actually has sort of sovereignty or ownership of Antarctica and can people actually own parts of the ice? And what is it like to obtain permits to do research in Antarctica? Yeah, it's, 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 it's not owned by anyone, actually. It's covered by the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed in the 50s. And um, the wording is all claims to Antarctica, no claims to Antarctica will be recognized or disputed. So no one talks about it, basically. So there's, there are claims that Antarctica's divided up into pies, pie-shaped slices. So there's the British Antarctic Survey, which kind of roughly goes where my cursor is here, but it completely overlaps with the Chilean, oh, sorry, it's not called that, it's called the British Antarctic Territories, but it completely overlaps with the Chilean Antarctic Territories and the Argentinian Antarctic Territories. So no one disputes these things and no one recognizes them. So it's, Antarctica is meant to be a peaceful continent, which is just there for exploration and science. So permits are, I think, exclusively done through national research um, organizations like the US Antarctic program or the British Antarctic survey. And so, um, yeah, each nation gives out permits to work in their territory, even though other countries would never recognize that it's their territory. For the most part, everyone tries to keep it completely peaceful and non-confrontational. Right. 
Thank you for that. We have a question about what inspired you to become a glaciologist. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think um, when I was an undergraduate, so I was like 23 or something, I was decided that after doing physics, I decided that most scientific fields interested me. In. So anything that I learned about in detail, uh, in enough detail, I would find exciting, I would find interesting. So I decided to, if, if that's the, if I can be excited about anything, why not just do something which is, which also allows you to go into, to explore, uh, you know, and, and do lots of field work and, and have important implications for, for society. So, so glaciology seemed like a good option because I always wanted to go to Antarctica and um, sea level rise is seen as a really important thing. So really that was it. I decided any field, it doesn't matter what it was, I would have been excited about. So why not do something which is also like really important and gets you to do lots of traveling? Great. In a related question, what are the differences of doing glaciology research in Antarctica versus the Arctic? Um, there's a lot of similarities. I did, I have done field work in Greenland and um, Greenland is the ice sheet in the Arctic. And those are the, that's actually the place where I experienced the coldest temperatures. I was camping in a similar setup to the pictures I showed you, but the, the temperatures were minus, got down to minus 35 at night. So camping in that temperature is really, really cold. And in lots of ways, it's very similar. One thing about Greenland is there's a lot more melting on the surface because overall, over year round, on average, it's warmer there than it is in, in Antarctica. So um, there's a lot more meltwater around. So people do a lot more research where they're looking at how streams form on the surface and lakes form and things like that. Having said that, recently our research group has been getting into studying lakes and streams on the surface of Antarctica too. So maybe in the future, we'll be able to go down and do research, uh, similar research down there. Great. A bit of a jump back to the history of Antarctica mm -hmm. uh, ice sheets. Uh, do we know when the West Antarctic ice sheet was first formed? How old is it? Uh, how do we ascertain uh, its history? Now, I can't remember West Antarctica. East Antarctica is like 16 million years or something. No, 34 million years was, was, West, was, was East Antarctica. And do we know when West Antarctica first formed? I'm not sure. And I would not, and actually things are very uncertain. So I wouldn't be surprised if we actually don't have a good date for that. Um, what I, and I could get back to you with the, actual, with, with the best estimate. But what I do know is there's a big debate on at the moment about whether the whether the West Antarctica collapsed during the last time we had really warm temperatures, which was 120,000 years ago. Because you know the climate gets, at the moment it's getting colder and colder and colder and then warmer, colder and colder and colder like that, and then warmer, like a sawtooth shape. And that happens every like 100,000 years. And the last time it was warm, like it is now, you know, like our civilization and everything has been, has developed in very stable warm temperatures. Well, it was like that 120,000 years ago, kind of. And the big debate is like, did Antarctica collapse when it was that warm last time? Because it could help us tell whether it's gonna collapse in the future now. And um, it's actually proved really difficult to get conclusive evidence either way, because it's always just so difficult to get evidence from that far, from that far in the past. Great. The next couple of questions are sort of all related to sea level rise and climate change and Antarctica. So does the change in sea level mean that climate change indeed has a significant impact on Antarctica and its icy surfaces? Based on your own research and data, what strategies can be implemented, do you think, to slow this process? And how do you generally deal with climate deniers about sea level change and climate change? or sea level rise and climate change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, the first question was whether, whether um, human impact is affecting Antarctica, is that correct? Uh, the, yeah. Well, in fact, it's quite complicated. So in the Antarctic Peninsula, where the climate is a bit warmer, that certainly seems the case. Temperatures here are much warmer than, it's one of the fastest warming parts of the, of, of the planet. Now, the other changes which are causing a lot of concern are in this location, which is a little bit 
further round, a bit further round counterclockwise, we're not actually sure how that relates to changes all around the, the rest of the planet because it's actually a complicated setup where waters are like warm ocean water is lapping up against the ice. And that, and how much energy is, how much heat is supplied by the ocean is not just about how warm the ocean is, it's actually about where the currents go. Do they actually bring the energy up to the side of the ice or not? And so there is evidence to suggest that those currents have changed because the winds have changed and the winds have changed because of changes in the pl changes in the rest of the earth system, in the rest of the atmosphere, which has been caused by humans. But actually that's not very well established. It's not very clear. In Greenland, it's very, very clear that it's very much to do with human impact. But this location here, which is where we're all focusing right now in Antarctica, it's not so much. Um, so all that's to say, basically, sea level rise today is, for the most part, down to humans. This concern we have in Antarctica, we don't really know, because it's not doing very much now, but it might do in the future. We don't know whether that's going to be exacerbated by human impact or not. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. So we, re we just need to work out what's going to happen and why. Uh, how do I deal with climate deniers? I would, usually I would just stick to my expertise very closely and say, well, I haven't read every single paper which the IPCC cites. I haven't read every climate paper which climate change paper out there but I do know a lot about the ice part and this is what we know and this is you know this is we, this is what we this is how we see carbon dioxide effects in the atmosphere warming it up this is how we see carbon dioxide effects in the ocean and we know from basic glaciology and pe stuff people have known for years that warming up the atmosphere in the ocean tends to melt the ice caps melt the ice sheets and so that's the basics and then we and then you just present the observations and i um you know i didn't show too many observations of antarctica here but you could sh you, there's comprehensive observations showing that this part of the ice sheet is shrinking and um and this part of the ocean is warmed and changes in snowfall uh, associated with all these changes so there's plenty of things to point to if you need to um present people with with data to support this position, because it's not just a, a hunch, it's very, very clearly backed up by um, careful, comprehensive observations. Right. And since we're on this map here, there's about whether or not that's a mountain ridge running down the west side, and is this related to past tecton tectonic movements? Yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah, so this actually is the same mountain range, almost, you know, kind of the same mountain range, which goes all the way down through the Rockies, Canadian and, and um, American Rockies, and then down through the Andes, and then joins up with this, well, doesn't quite join up because there's this, this Drake passage here, which is an ocean passage, but you leap over that and then you get to the Antarctic Peninsula and then the, the, the mountain range continues and cuts through here all the way through. And these are called the Transantarctic Mountains because they cut across Antarctica. And at least this section of these, this is associated with tectonic movements and it's associated with this part of the ice, of the tectonic plate rifting, meaning it's breaking, in, breaking apart. So this section has been moving that direction. This section has been moving that direction. And what happens is when they get a rift like that, it stretches in one direction and squashes in the other. And so the, the ground actually gets deeper. And that's the, really the reason that Antar East, West Antarctica is grounded below sea level, because it sits a, a, on top of the West Antarctic rift system. There's a whole bunch of rifts all stretching like this and causing thinning, and then that ground ends up below sea level. So again, another link, all the, all the things all link together. Great. I'm going to squeeze in one last question at 2.59. And yep. for those of you uh, who did not get to ask your questions or did not get uh, your questions answered, please feel free to email me directly afterwards. So, Johnny, this is a nice concluding question, I think, is whether or not you've ever faced life-threatening circumstances while doing research in Antarctica or Greenland, for that uh, for the matter. 
fact. Uh, did you ever feel like backing out? What were some of the scary things, uh, but also what inspires you to keep going back? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did feel like backing out sometimes, absolutely. I don't think I faced very many um, actually dangerous situations. The, uh, the danger, the background danger is that you're really far away from, from medical help if anything did go wrong, like, a, like an injury. Um, you do your medical before you go, so they make sure that you're unlikely to have any um, non, you know, the kind of injury, like the kind of medical issue, which isn't just an injury, basically, like a heart failure or something like that. They try and make sure that people are not going to have that. But there is this risk of injury because you're driving around on surfaces of the ice, which sometimes there are these hidden cracks, which you can, you know, if you drove into that can really, you can really get injured. So there's that background danger. But I personally have been lucky and because of that background danger, everyone is incredibly careful, you know, so the, the, it's hard to mitigate that. You can't bring a, an emergency room doctor with you to make, to remove that danger. But you, the way that you get around it is by being incredibly cautious. So if there's any likelihood of any cracks anywhere nearby, you only go in the best perfect conditions and you drive very slowly and you, and um and you wear mountaineering equipment to save you if you do fall in and all, all those kinds of things so overall the risk is mitigated by by that practice but it's a it's a hard thing to do it's a hard thing to spend three months away from home and and um it's it's not something that you can do every year i not something that i personally could do every year some people do that but i wouldn't want to do it just for personal reasons being away all that time even if it is like one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had, uh, I wouldn't want to do it every year. <laughs> well, great. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you to our wonderful audience for those great questions. Yeah. This has definitely been one of the most active sessions. So thank you everybody for your participation. Uh, Johnny, any last words you'd like to, to share with our audience? Yeah. yeah, well, thanks so much for listening in and please like reach out with more questions. And then Elizabeth Case, who's a grad student, I don't know if Cassie, you're going to mention this anyway, but she's a grad student working with me on uh, using radar again and looking at how ice flows and actually looking how snow compacts down into ice. And she's going to be doing a talk on Wednesday afternoon, right? That's, yes. yeah. And I think she's going to do some demonstrations yeah. about how ice flows like a fluid and and so, and she's a great communicator. She used to be a journalist before she came back into academia. So she's a really good science communicator. So uh, if you're interested, tune into that as well. But thank you so much. Yeah, great. Thank you, Johnny. Yes, and uh, just for those of you who are still here, on Wednesday, we are doing this again at 2 p.m. And as Johnny said, Elizabeth Case is going to be presenting. She's going to be sharing more. It'll be a demonstration because she'll actually show us how to make glacier goo, which will actually represent how ice moves and the physics behind ice flows quite nicely. Uh, we have a recipe online. So if you do want to get some of the ingredients ahead of time, you're trying to follow that demo, uh, mm -hmm. please go to our, our website. Website. It's on the State of the Planet blogs, or just email me directly. If you have questions that did not get answered by Johnny, please email me directly as well, and we'll make sure to get those to you. Once we have this video uh, edited to make sure that we've got all the information captured, we will send everyone who has RSVP'd for today a link to watch the video. And as I said, we will have additional EI Live content uh, for K-12 students and, and educators as well, all the way up until the end of the school year. Uh, again, if you have feedback about our sessions or if there's a topic that you really would love to see, please get in touch. And with that, we'll see you Wednesday uh, for our next uh, EI Live K-12 series. Thank you again, Johnny, and thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.